Hi everyone, we're just going to get started in a minute or so, so we're just going to wait for a few people to join and we'll get started at 6pm on the dot. All right, so just a few more joining at the moment. Great, so we're going to get started. So hi everyone and welcome to this treatment case study webinar. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well. So just a bit of an introduction. I'm Katie and I am the training and education manager here at Physiquip. So Physiquip, for those who don't know, provides evidence-based medical technology and training. So I'm joined today by Anisia Barron, and Anisia is a occupational therapist and a hand specialist based in the Pulver Taft Hand Centre within the Royal Derby Hospital. Anisia is going to present a patient case study and tell us how she has adopted a range of treatment methods throughout her career to treat specific hand injuries, including the use of IASTEM, so instrument assisted soft tissue mobilisation. The format of today's webinar will be a presentation from Anisia, followed by a Q&A session. So if you have a question at any time, then please just submit that using the Q&A section, which you'll find on the bottom tab. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Anisia now and she's going to start the presentation. Hi everybody, thanks so much for joining. Um, so today what we're going to do is I'm going to, um, during the presentation, I'm going to aim to present a case study of a patient that I've treated following a flexor tendon repair, um, who then went on to develop a fixed flexion deformity post-operatively. Um, so in order to help, um, I'm going to discuss briefly the relevant anatomy. I'm going to demonstrate the therapy intervention that I used for this patient. And I'm gonna demonstrate the use of hawk grips as part of the patient's treatment, and then also prevent, present the outcomes of the patient's treatment as well. So the patient is a 33 year old male with a history of mental health issues of anxiety, depression, and stress. He reports he gets very easily frustrated and angry. The patient sustained a knife laceration to his right dominant little finger following an altercation with his neighbours. The laceration was across the volar aspect of the little finger at zone two, and this is a notoriously difficult, difficult area for injury due to the complexity of the structures within the, the area of this finger. The patient's injury involved both the flexor tendons, the flexor digitorum superficialis, and the flexor digitorum profundus or FDS and FDP. And throughout the presentation, I will use the abbreviated terminology. The surgery was delayed as we were currently in the midst of COVID-19 and the usual theater lists were not running and the patient needed to wait for a slot in the main trauma theater. And this was shared by a number of different specialities. Surgery involved repair of only one tendon and this was the FDP, which is not uncommon. And this is because the injury was directly over the volar PIP, therefore repairing both tendons would have led to a bulky repair and potentially a poor long-term outcome as movement of the joints depends on smooth tendon glide through the flexor pulley system. And this will be discussed a little bit later on. So the patient commenced the therapy the following day and was placed in a forearm based controlled active motion splint. Usual treatments for zone two flexor repair in our center would be the short cam regime. However, due to the patients demonstrating some compliance issues, it was deemed safer to over protect in a forearm based splint. The patient then commenced a normal home exercise program, which include passive flexion, blocked active extension of both the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints, and gentle active flexion. He was treated in the splint for approximately five weeks. I'm just going to discuss anatomy of the flexor tendons in a little bit more detail. So anatomy of the digits is quite complex and we have two flexor tendons in our fingers, the FDS and the FDP. In the little finger, the FDS is sometimes weak or absent. The flexor tendons are held in close proximity to the bone by the annular pulleys and the cruciate ligaments. 
the tendons glide through smoothly through the pulley system or the flexor sheath as it is also known. When we flex the flexor sheath concertina style, holding the flexors into tight against the bone. Without some of the crucial pulleys, as we flex, the tendons would migrate away from the bone, leading to poor movement and bowstringing of the tendons. Any increased bulk through the pulley system, as I've said, will lead to poor quality tendon glide, which is why only one of the FD, which is, uh, one of the tendons was repaired. Because the FDP tendon crosses both the proximal and the distal interphalangeal joints, it has an action for flexion across all the joints in the finger. The PIP joint is quite a complex little joint. It's a hinge joint. However, this does allow for a little bit of translation and rotation. Stability of the joint is due to the structures that insert around the joint. The volar plate is a fibrocartilaginous structure and has a thicker attachment that inserts distally and then proximally it thins out and splits into the checkering ligaments and inserts onto the proximal phalanx. Its function is to provide stability and to prevent hyperextension. The joint is further stabilised laterally by the collateral ligaments and the accessory collateral ligaments, as well as some support dorsally from the extensor expansion. The collateral ligaments provide stability of the joint and the two main ligaments are the true collateral and the accessory collateral. Um, they provide stability when the joint is in different positions. The collateral ligament is tight in flexion and the accessory collateral ligament is tight in extension. So in reality, we're not looking at just one structure. We're looking at lots of different anatomical structures, which all perform differently depending on the position of the joint is in. Flexion makes a lot of these structures tight and short, making active and passive extension difficult in the presence of scar tissue. With the addition of a surgery, scar tissue that isn't just confined to the surgical incision, a potentially bulky repair, and also the biomechanics of the hand in the fact that we're working with very short levers, especially with the little finger, this all adds up to the complication of a joint contracture and can often make them extremely problematic to treat. Patients who develop fixed flexion deformities of the PIP joint often have a poorer outcome. So due to the patient living nearly two and a half hours away from Derby and due to the restrictions that we had in place due to COVID-19, he was reviewed face-to-face -face alternate weeks and with a telephone review in between. Ordinarily, we would have reviewed him face-to-face -face weekly or transferred him locally. However, we kept him um, in Derby just because it was um, better for his treatment. The tables um, I'll go through over the next few slides will all show the patient's range of movement. In the slides, range of movement will be shown as extension over flexion. At two weeks, the patient had removed his splint himself. However, fortunately, his tendon repair remained intact. At week four, you can see that the flexion was improving. However, this was, he was already starting to develop a fixed flexion deformity at his PIP joint, and this isn't uncommon with flexor tendon repairs. His scar was quite thick and tethered, so treatment was focusing on scar management. We provided him with a dorsal extension splint, where all the time in between exercises within the splint, um, and this was to address the flexion contracture. He was given home exercises out of the splints with guidance to commence light function out of his splint from five weeks, week five, sorry. Um, at five weeks, we carried out a further telephone review and he felt that there were no improvements in extension despite wearing the splint constantly and doing um, his scar management. So therefore we arranged another face-to-face -face appointment. At week six, um, he returned and it was evident that despite continuing treatment, the fixed flexion deformity was progressing. The scar remained tethered and the pull through of the tendon was limited. Treatment involved focusing on self-care, self-scar massage. A Dyson sheet was provided for friction massage. 
the retained you had a little retained suture that was causing some hypersensitivity and this was removed by the nurse and we gave them advice on desensitization we provided a cape and a splint for intermittent use during the day with clear instructions not to flex against it So unfortunately, the patient was unable to attend for a few weeks. And when he did return at week 10, his fixed flexion deformity had, had increased despite splint work and judicial scar management. Um, just to sort of reiterate, at the beginning, we were quite concerned about compliance of this patient. However, as his treatment progressed, he actually became really, really compliant with all his treatments and was quite concerned regarding his outcome. His flexion was actually improving and functionally he was managing with some things, but obviously he was avoiding anything heavy lifting, anything other than heavy lifting as instructed by myself. And at this point, we had a long discussion regarding treatment options for him. Um, one of the treatment options could have been surgical intervention a little bit later down the line, which would have been a tenolysis to remove the scar tissue and potentially release the joint, but also trying more conservative me measures to try to improve the joint position first. He agreed to attend weekly therapy and also we did review a doc, um, provide a doctor's review. Um, at this point we were able to bring our patients in a little bit more because the COVID restrictions within the department had been relaxed a little bit. Um, and it was at this treatment session that I first introduced hall grips and chat carries out a very short treatment session um, with the patient um, just to ensure that he could actually tolerate the tools. So the patient attended from week 12 post-op um, for weekly appointments for heart grip applica application, scar management, passive stretches and splint progression. So the tool I used um, for my treatment was the HG9, which is the dual edge, but it's also known as the tongue depressor. And this was chosen for precision work on the small joints of the finger. An angle of about 45 degrees, but the brushing technique was maintained throughout. As the patient was a little hypersensitive along the scar, treatment initially started using the bevel down as it is a softer treatment edge and aimed to aid desensitization. And once I was confident that the patient could tolerate the tools, I switched to bevel up. This treatment edge dives into the soft tissues and will target specific areas of the scar and the soft tissues around the joint, specifically addressing the thickened scar tissue, the volar plate area, and the collateral ligaments of the PIP, all which contribute to a fixed flexion deformity at the joint. So I'm just gonna show you now um, a treatment session that I, oh, hold on, sorry about that, that I performed with the patient um, and I'll talk through with you how I did it. So what you can see is that I'm applying the hawk grip emollient using a um, spatula. Um, and this is to prevent, um, putting fingers into the treatment, uh, into the emollient. And as you can see, because I knew he was, com I was confident with him that he could tolerate the tools, I've gone straight in using the bevel up on this one, uh, sorry, down. Um, and I'm just using a sweeping technique um, to just brush down the soft tissues. And what you actually feel is that the tool is really responsive under your fingers. So you can actually feel the vibrations from the tool so you know exactly where the scar tissue is and where you get resistance so you know that you can actually work within those areas and i just work uh, distal to proximal and um, just gently brushing sorry the um along the soft tissues and actually you don't really need to press very deeply at all because the tool is really quite precise with the um treatment edge i'm just going to let this run for a minute Patients often say that they actually like the feel of the tools because they feel as though actually it's working and they can feel that gritty feeling as you're trying to work the soft tissues as well. And actually when you 
then go over it with your finger, the tool or your thumb, your, the, the, um, the scar tissue actually feels noticeably softer and reduced. So these pictures were at the same time. And as you can see from the side view, in picture one, the scar tissue was quite thickened. Um, in picture three, this shows isolating the glide of the FDP tendon, which you can see that isn't quite full. Um, and as you can see that it's often, it's the scar tissue that is actually limiting that full tendon excursion. However, in composite flexion, the patient has excellent range of movement. So here you can see progression over the weeks of treatment. The promising point is that with both treatment, with treatment, both active and passive range of movement, um, which is in brackets on my slides on the chart, um, was, also, was improved, but it was also maintained between each treatment. The patient we instructed to continue with scar massage throughout, maintain continual splint wear, removing for flexion and functional tasks as required. An interesting point is that at week 17, you'll notice that quite a, there was quite a significant loss in active and passive extension. And at this point, in, uh, we uh, discontinued the week before the splint use during the day, and it, the patient was instructed to wear this at night only. Following this, the patient was advised then to go back to continual um, uh, wear of the splint, removing again for exercises and some functional activities. Grip strength had also improved, um, and as you can see along the bottom, there was very little deficit from the affected and non-affected side, and his quick dash score was um, 36.4, which does fall within normal margins. However, there are some limitations with his um, hand function outcome, but this was mainly due to some sh ongoing shoulder pain. So these pictures were taken at week 19, and as you can see, he has near full extension. So we were about 12 minus 12 degrees off full extension. Isolated FDP glide does remain a little bit limited. However, he still maintains excellent full composite flexion. So it's currently, um, he doesn't require any ongoing surgery. His last doctor's review, they were really happy with the outcome. Um, so he currently didn't require any surgical intervention. He's returned to most functional tasks. The things that he's struggling with is things like tight grip um, uh, on a jar that he struggles with just because it's more of a dexterity problem at the minute, which we're working on. Um, because of the scar tissue and the fact that the, it can remain active for a long time, he's currently requiring long-term splinting to prevent the flexion deformity reoccurring, and we're monitoring, in, monitoring him intermittently. So in conclusion, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization is a useful tool for the treatment of some flexion deformities in the small joints of the hand, and it works well in combination with other therapy treatments such as splinting home exercise program. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anicia. Really, really good. And it's really nice to see just real patient case studies. So yeah, really good presentation. Um, we're going to go through some questions now. Just a reminder for everyone to submit them into the Q&A tab, just so that we can address those questions to Anicia. Just to mention, we also joined by Ken Johnson. Um, he's going to be um, answering some of your questions too. So Ken is a physical therapist from the US, and he's a certified Hawk Grips instructor and has a specialist interest in technology-assisted rehabilitation. So it'll be really good just to hear some of his thoughts, um, some of the questions that are put forward to. So we do have some pre-submitted questions. Um, so let's start with some of those. And the first question that I have here is, um, how did you get into using Hulk grips and what training did you need to have? So um, with regards to Hawk grips, so I was first introduced to Hawk grips through Andy Thomas, who is at PhysiQuip. And I've known Andy for over 12 years um, through uh, working with him in the BTA. And I also, as a result of working with Andy, I 
know Ken very well as well for, from us spending some time in Baltimore. Um, so obviously Andy introduced us to the Hawk Grips um, quite a few years ago and we had a few demonstrations from Dom and then also some training with Ken and that's probably where I picked up my interest in Hawk Grips. Um, I also last year completed the level one instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization course that was run by PhysiQuip, which was absolutely excellent. And then as a result of that, I was able to take back the um, using the Hawk Grips into my practice and also using it with a wide variety of different um, patients as well. Right. And what sort of what tools did you get from the, the training that you received from the Hawk Grips? And did you get a, a sort of set of Hawk Grips or did you just, you know, get the one from the training? Yeah. That you got? So we're really fortunate in the department to have the full set of Hawk Grips um, and we also have the multi tool as well. So actually, when it comes to tool choice, we are actually are really fortunate to be able to have all the tools that are available via the Hawk Grip range. Um, and again, it just comes down to preference of which ones you like. The multi-tool is a brilliant tool um, if that's all that you have in the department because it has lots of different treatment edges. But also if you've got the, the whole set as we're fortunate to have, then, you know, that's really great as well. So that this question here then, so why did you use that specific tool that you demonstrated uh, within the treatment in this particular case? So I used this tool, which is the HD9. And I like this one because it's it's really easy to hold, but also it's actually um, works very well on the small um, joints of the finger because actually it only has a very small treatment edge and it works really precise at actually working deep into the, the small tissues. And if you think to the anatomy pictures that I showed you, it's not just one structure that you're working at, you're working on lots of different structures. And when you've got scar tissue, that could all be encased within every single structure within that joint. And um, this is really great for actually breaking down the scar tissue and trying to mobilize that and to loosen up the structures that will be tight and shorter as a, as a result of the patient being held into flexion because of the scar tissue. Okay, great. And then you showed also the techniques so that bevel up and the bevel down techniques. So yes. what was the different effect that you were trying to achieve from both of those techniques? So when you use bevel down, so if you think, I'll try and so you've got a treatment edge like so, and this one's quite good because you've got um, the bevel, that is bevel up, and then when you flip it over, it's bevel down. Now, because it, when you use it bevel down, that treatment edge is actually smoother and softer. So actually, it's, it's, um, it's not, it doesn't work as deep. So actually, if you're using it for first time, I would always start with that in that position because it gets the patient used to it rather than going in for something that might be quite uncomfortable to start with. If they're not expecting it. So I'd start with bevel down because he was a little bit hypersensitive. That's great for working um, a bit of, um, into the soft tissues for the hypersensitivity. Then I will flip to um, bevel up so that the treatment edge is up. And then that is the edge that you will work to actually work deep into the soft tissues to actually work and, and break down that scar tissue. Okay, great. And you mentioned some of the other um, types of tools that you um, have got. And would, was there any other tools that you chose to treat in this case as well for this particular condition? No, so for this particular condition, I did just use the HG9. However, you could use this one, which is the HG4. And that is good because it has a double beveled edge. So it works the same as the um, HG9 by diving into the tissues, but also because it actually has a curved edge as well, um, which is a double bevel and a single bevel on it, you can actually work up and down the, the finger as well to mobilize the scar tissue. Um, so I could have chosen that one, but because the HG9 tool was working really effectively, that's why I stuck with that tool. Okay, great. So I've just opened up the uh, Q&A box now. So we're gonna go through these questions. So we have a question from Holly and she has asked, in your experience, would you say this is a typical result using this tool? And have you used it to break down scar tissue on the volar surface, which is inhibiting flexion? Yeah, so I've used this. So if often there's other um, conditions that cause fixed flexion deformities in the hands um, that we see quite regularly. And one of those is a volar plate injury. 
And often when we have patients, when I have patients who have bowler plate injuries and develop fixed flexion deformities, I will always go to hawk grips and you actually see that they do work well to improve the flexion deformities. Great. So the next question is, oops, I just flicked it. <laughs> Sorry, one second, just going to scroll. So did, um, so this is a question, did he have any bruise in post hot grips you? So this is for the case study that you've presented today. Uh, no. No, um, I think it's really important that when you use the hawk grips that you actually really monitor the skin of the patient um, at all times. And if at any point you see any breakdown, any of the little red capillaries, that's an indication to stop your treatment. So with him, actually, my treatment session was only very short um, and there was, ne there was never any bruising with him. And you really shouldn't cause bruising. You might cause a little bit of redness that should settle down, but I wouldn't get to the point where I've caused bruising. Okay. And would you tend to get any feedback from the patient of it being um, quite tender or sore after using the... the some, yeah, sometimes you might say there's a little bit of tenderness, but I would also then use that next time as, as uh, their feedback, which is really important to then ga gauge my next treatment. And if they'd said that it was either really painful or they'd had an abnormal response to it, then it would be an indication to either stop treatment or consider using a softer edge. Okay, great. And we've got another question from Julia who just asked that previous question. Um, Julia has asked, how early could you use it post flexor? Um, probably around about four weeks. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Great. You usually, wait. You need to make sure that all the soft tissues are completely healed. Okay. As well. Good. So the next question here. So. Um, saying thanks for the great talk and how long for how long the splint is used and how old for a PIPJ contraction and can uh, can it be treated with or without surgery so sorry just repeat that one again Katie sorry that was me as well. <laughs> so she's um so said thank you for the great talk and for how long can you use a splint and for how old of a PIPJ contraction can be treated with or without surgery Okay, so um, in this case, I would probably, because I'm worried that the contracture is caused by the scar tissue, I would probably continue with his splint for anything up to six months, okay, to make sure that we're addressing the scar tissue, because as we know, scar tissue, as it matures, it, it becomes tightened and contracts. So we would always advise them to use some sort of scar management for that amount of time. And for him, because we had such a quick response in, in him losing his flexion when we discontinued the splint, for him, I'd probably want to keep him in some sort of splintage for a minimum of six months. Um, with PIP contractures, um, I think it depends on the nature of the contracture and the cause of the contracture as to whether, how long you would splint for, um, uh, for how long you splint for and it, whether or not they'd need surgery does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely okay. great so we're back on a question um for using the hot grips and julia has asked how long did you need to perform the treatment and did you start off shorter time and then build up um so i think for him um my treatment time was probably less than five minutes each time just on the hot grips um because uh, I think that was that was all that that we needed. Because you could actually feel that as you went over it, you were actually breaking down that scar tissue, and you were being really effective. So I think that whole treatment session that I had was less than a minute and a half on there. So it, it just depends on each treatment session, really. Okay, and a question here then. So have you used the hot grips tool for any other hand injuries? Yeah, so um, for anything that it, any any hand injury that you get a scar with, it's great for breaking down the scar tissue. So patients with uh, Jupiterans, we've used them with um, just any anybody that's got a thickened and a tethered scar, you can use them on. Um, but also we, we use them a lot with tendinopathies. So things like your tennis elbow, deferens tenosynovitis as well. So you can use it for a multitude of different hand conditions. Okay, great. So we have a question here now. How, um, how often do you use the tools? How often do we use the tools? So, um, well, 
as a, in, a, in our department, they're used quite a lot. And often when you go to look for the tools, you can't find the tools because somebody's got them. So they've really increased in popularity over the past, well, as, as how long we've had them. As part of my treatment, um, it depends on the patient as well. And so if I feel that it's, it's relevant, I will use it as part of my treatment. So on a weekly um, basis, probably four or four times or something like that, probably more. It depends. Okay, great. So I think that comes nicely on to the next question that we have here, which is, are you the only one in the department able to use the tools? And in the pre-submitted questions that I have, this sort of covers um, also how have you got other members, if you've got other members which are using the tools, how have you got them on board using them? So some of our team actually um, attended the presentation a couple of years ago that Penn did. So we've got some uh, expertise. And then when I came back from um, the my level one, I sort of trained up some of the team on just the basic use of the tools so that the team can actually facilitate it as part of their treatment. So we have the um, so I will sort of issue some training with them to our staff and also our assistants as well, so that they can carry out the treatment programmes with the tools. So often we get our patients to come regularly to see our assistants for them to do things like the scar management side of things, and they will utilise it as part of their treatments as well. Great. Okay, so I'm going to get Ken involved now. So hopefully, Ken, you can hear me. Um, so I just want to propose this question to you. So um, obviously, with your knowledge of having um, sort of a wider range of um, using tools and maybe other technologies in um, a rehabilitation, is there any other soft tissue mobilising tools or technology that would be beneficial specifically for treating hand or finger injuries? Um, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, Anisi has done a fantastic job articulating uh, sort of the, the rationale, the reason why we would use um, the I asked him approach. And, you know, we think through sort of the, some of the different physiological uh, phases that we go through in healing um, and, and some of the, the ways that we want to act on them, whether it's, you know, using a compressive uh, type of mechanical stress. So, you know, I asked them is, is a great way to, to get in and to do that. We can use, um, you know, things like focused shockwave is another way to provide uh, an acoustic type of mechanical stress um, as well. You know, there's trade-offs there in terms of, um, you know, equipment cost and things like that, that, that can affect it. Um, I know, you know, here in our practice, we use uh, Tecar. We use a, a product called Winback, um, which is uses a radio frequency uh, to to um, to heat the tissue. Then we'll typically, uh, once we've prepared the tissue, we'll use the iastem tools. The hawk grips um, will will be the next entry, and then uh, focus shockwave with the um, the the elevation or Okay, so wave two. Um, you know, those are those are uh, where we would start, and then once we've compressed and sort of stressed the tissue, we'll use a decongestive type of uh, modality, whether it's a uh, like a limpa touch or um, silicone cups. That's why I was actually a little bit late today; I was just finishing up with the patient. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the the beauty of of all this is the you know. We talk a lot about evidence and evidence supporting or evidence informing what we do. And I think, again, Anisia uh, really highlighted this well with um, sort of translating some of the techniques that she you know, would have already done maybe in the old days with her hands um, and her thumbs <laughs> and stressing it. But, you know, using a, an, an instrument, you know, that's going to take the stress off of, of her uh, her hand and impart it to the tissue. And for me, it's the last point I wanted to make. What's, what's interesting is, um, you know, that actual application, you know, most therapists or physios were familiar with the idea of doing cross friction massage. Um, and that, that tool, that technique was actually the, the thing that sort of conceptually helped me 
um, over the hump with, with Iastin. Um, and it's referenced in a study that was done in 2009 by uh, Dr. Lagmani, where they took, um, you know, they took mice and they did cross friction massage uh, over a, a medial collateral ligament. Um, obviously, it's easier to standardize um, practice with, with mice than people. Um, but that study was very visually um, convincing to me as to, to what we were doing and, and that it was actually having an effect. And I can share those slides if you'd like me to, but um, you know, supportive of Anicia's comment that she uses it, maybe treatments five minutes. You know, what's interesting with the Lagmani study is that it was showing success in treating for one minute, three times a week. I mean, this is one minute of cross friction massage. Um, and there was a significant difference in tissue healing. Um, so again, that's the other, it, it just helps us be more efficient in our practice. So, Absolutely. Sorry, that was <laughs> Very comprehensive answer, Ken, a little bit. <laughs> okay, so I think that's, you've obviously touched on um, answering the next question, which we had as well, which is what is the evidence base for this tool, um, which you've obviously just answered there. Um, we're going to go on to the next question now. So this is, do you usually keep the patient still or do you ever get the patient to do uh, differential slides at the same time? So Nisia, can I give that question back to you? Yeah, you can do. I think it depends on the treatment area as well, because obviously in the finger, it's quite small. So you can usually get your, think, your hands in, but it might be that might be part of things that you could get them to do at home as well. Or if, say, for example, you were treating somebody who had an extensor tendon injury, where you often find that tethering of the tendons become a little bit uh, uh, more prevalent in that area. You can actually use the hawk grips to do that, but also you can use other treatment modalities such as Dyson that you can give the patient to do as at home as well. Um, I don't know whether you've seen Dyson. So Dyson is just a little bit of a rubber matting sheet. It's what, as an OT, we used to give to people to stop their plates moving around on the table. But actually in hand therapy, it's one of those things that we can give the patients to take home. And actually from a, cr a friction point of view, you get a really good purchase on the skin. Um, to do a little bit of friction massage and then you actually obviously can add a bit of traction to get some uh, different tendon glide underneath the scar as well but you could also do that with the hawk grips as well so you can get do a little bit of friction and then get the tendon the patients to do some um, active range of movement at the same time to help with the tendon glides and friction. Yeah great. So the next question we have here is, is it a common occurrence to see the scar tissue build up and is there anything preventative that you can do? So I think scar tissue is, is a very personal thing. So it's as a therapist, it's one of the things that we can't control. So how your body heals is really, you know, some people heal with very little scar tissue. Some people um, produce um, quite a lot of scar tissue. So it's not something that really we can control, but actually if you start, the sooner you start addressing the scar tissue and breaking that down as it's actually trying to form um, and lay down new scar tissue, you actually are still breaking down those cross links and causing less tethering. So the sooner you can treat scar tissue, the better. Absolutely, Ken, can I um, also ask you that question as well? So I can, um, with regards to preventative measures possibly for scar that build, scarring that builds up? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, moving, you know, movement and motion, uh, trying to keep them as active as possible. Um, I, again, I, we do try to incorporate movement uh, into the use of the tools when appropriate. Um, and then reinforce that with their home exercise program to keep them mobile. Um, and similar to like the Dyson technique, uh, you know, we've also found that, um, of course I don't have any on my desk, Anisia came prepared with a little sample. Um, but you know, when you do the McConnell taping and you have the white tape uh, that goes under the Lupo tape, if you uh, sort of take the, I use a post -it note, if you take the, you take the white tape and like stick it down onto the tissue so that it has a little tag on it, you know, then you can take and, you know, mobilize the tissue, mobilize the fibers. Um, you know, that's another uh, 
uh, technique that we'll use for self-mobilization um, after, but. Right, perfect. So this is a question um, sort of for both of you, um, Julie, in, in both of your sort of clinical settings that you have. Um, how do you get the team to buy in to use new tools and treatment techniques? So Anissia, do you want to start with that one? Um, so um, I think it was, it, well, I think you in our team, there was two camps. So you're, I think wherever you always have people who think, oh, actually, you know, they're, they're, they're quite an expensive tool. So, you know, there's different things that we can use. Um, but I think for me, it's more been um, them using the tools and getting used to it. So I think it's one of those things that until you use the tools, um, I think it's, you learn to love, you not learn to love them because they are great, but um, you know, it's, it's about people getting involved and using them, but also stressing the benefits of the tools for us to actually, before heart grips or, you know, using these treatment techniques, you would use your hands. So actually in a hand therapist and, and physios, there's a high prevalence of, of physios um, who have thumb injuries or you know degenerative joint wear and tear because of manual mobilizations that they do with their thumbs. So actually what these tools are doing is they're taking away the pressure that we exert through our thumbs. And we know that actually our thumbs are a load bearing joint. They're one of the ones that wear and gets wear and tear through osteoarthritis quite quickly. So actually if we can preserve our joints by using um, different tools um, and reducing the pressure, then actually you're on a win-win situation. And Ken, have you got anything as well to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, Anissia says it all so well. So I, I agree. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the issue with the cost is, is the trade-off, you know, um, you, you know, taking care of, and for me, uh, taking care of our staff and, and therapists and clinicians, helping them to be healthy so that they can, um, you know, be productive and, and care for patients uh, without the physical stress. Um, you know, that, that's, I think, a critical, um, you know, a critical component to, to all of this. So. Yeah. Great, right, thank you. So we've just got time for a couple more questions before we're due to, to finish. So we've got a question from Hannah. Um, so can you use the heart grips on larger scars such as burns and skin grafts? So Nisia, have you got anything? Um, so I, when in our department, I don't, we don't treat burns. We do treat, treat skin grafts. And I think, yes, you can, but actually you need to make sure that that skin graft is, mature and um, that there's no chance of it breaking down and I would probably exert a little bit of caution to start with with that um, I think using just lighter techniques is probably a little bit more effective with this with um, uh, a skin graft because actually you really need to protect the integrity of the skin graft so it's something that I would probably approach with caution I don't know whether you'd agree Ken absolutely I mean I would you know definitely use bevel side down. Um, and I would question, softer. yeah, using the softer edge. Um, and I find that, uh, you know, using techniques like a more of a pin and stretch, you know, where instead of sliding over the, the tissue or the scar, um, maybe to apply like a downward force and press into the tissue and then try to move um, to, to mobilize the, the limb or the joint underneath that. Um, and also using it either proximal or distal to where that scar may be, uh, just to try to, you know, create some extra mobility of tissue that may attach to the scar. But yeah, I, burns in particular because of the vascularization um, of, of that tissue is, is something I, like Anisia, exert extreme caution. Mm -hmm. And in your experience, Ken, with treating around the hands, fingers, injuries, um, have you got experience in treating specific burns? And is there anything else that you would use instead, you know, in which would, instead of the iastum, so the other technologies that you mentioned previously? Again, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, the Wimback and uh, the Tekar uh, type of treatment because that produces a deep heating uh, that 
you know, that makes patients feel better. It softens the collagen, um, loosens the, the, the bonding of, of the, the tissue uh, that makes it more mobile and people feel more comfortable. So, you know, certainly starting there and then, um, you know, where friction could be a concern or a problem, you know, the focus shock wave, which is much different than the radial shock wave, um, because I'm, we're just using a very targeted focus shock wave. You know, I think, you know, those are probably the only things that we might consider is, is, um, is, is different. Um, and then with negative pressure, you know, using a, a, a negative pressure cup or a computer controlled negative pressure therapy, um, you know, would be the alternative. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so I think that's all the questions there. And if we haven't managed to um, answer your questions, then we will um, get in touch and email them over to you. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the session. And thank you to Anicia and Ken for your time and your expertise. Um, following this, you will receive a survey along with the link to the webinar recording. So we would really appreciate any feedback that you have or any suggestions on future webinars. So with regards to upcoming webinars, um, we do have a product meeting um, coming up next week. So this is for anyone interested in specifically the heart grip tools um, and also we'll be talking about the lymph touch as well, which is what Ken briefly mentioned as well. Um, so that meeting is specifically for anyone who is interested in both of those technologies and tools. Um, we also have a, another webinar coming up, which is going to be presented by Ken. And this is a shocking approach to managing myofascial pain. So Ken will be talking about using shockwave therapy um, if you hadn't a guest from the title already. Um, so as always, you can contact us at any time if you're interested in any of our technology or events and you can reach us on info at physiquip.com. So thank you again, Anicia and Ken, and thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you have um, a good rest of the evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you.